city of dreams, capital of fabulous desires. Here drill the heroes of ten thousand myths, glowing with imagination fine. We're speaking today with Robert Carl Cohen, writer, director, producer, auteur of the cult classic film Mondo Hollywood. Produced between 65 and 67, it was released and caused a sensation around the world, including being banned in France. As, as you were shooting the film, did the structure just begin to appear, or was it uh, quite a bit after that you had gathered the imagery that you figured out how to tie it all together? In the beginning, when I first began shooting, I was looking for a model of some kind. And I said, okay, I've lived in Hollywood since 1939, and this is now 1965. Okay, almost 30 years. <clears throat> I grew up here. I went to grammar school, junior high, high school, university, and so on. Lived in Europe for four years, now back in Hollywood. Hollywood, I mean the total Southern California area. My initial approach was Dante's Inferno. <laughs> okay? I How thought, so? <laughs> well, I thought of doing it <laughs> as a series of logias. In fact, I filmed... Uh, Explain a, that word to me. A logia is a balcony. Okay. And in Dante's Inferno, as Virgil, who's Dante's guide, leads him deeper and deeper into hell. They go from one level to the next, each time to a lower and lower level, the level of the hypocrites, the, the level of the thieves, the level of the people who betray their wives and husbands, the, you know, and so on and so forth. But as, as, as Bergman once said, making a film consists of murdering your favorite children, or words to that effect. Uh, I had this going, it wasn't that great, what I was getting from the people was much more interesting than any preconcept mm -hmm. that I had. Mm -hmm. And so really, I just started filming, filming, filming. And then, in the editing room, I, I, I put up little three by five cards, mm -hmm. okay, with each scene, and the basic import of what the person was doing, and then tried to put them into some kind of coherent sequence. Okay. And effectively, effectively, what it became was a 24-hour day. Although the opening, the opening scene of, uh, of uh, the uh, Christian and the Communist Crusade is at mm -hmm. night, we then jump to uh, morning. Lewis Beach Marvin wakes up in his garage. He says, it's around, I usually get up around 10 a.m. Okay. Mm -hmm. Before that, Margarita Ramsey, the uh, actress, the leading lady, mm -hmm. has woken up. They're sleeping outside in Gregory Peck's old house. And so it became a 24-hour day, uh, which I didn't push on people. But for example, when uh, Carol Cole speaks at the uh, Hollywood Chamber of Commerce luncheon, okay, it's noon. We see a clock. We see a clock on the wall at Hollywood mm. Vine. It says noon, and then we go through into the night of Hollywood, and we reemerge the next morning with Arinder climbing up to the cross on the top of the Hollywood Hills. So effectively, it's a 24-hour cycle. It's a day in Hollywood, point by point, without pushing it very much. But that became the overall uh, mm. sequence. And, and uh, I begin with the Christian anti-communist crusade, and I end effectively with Ronald Reagan, okay, uh, uh, with his speech uh, uh, denouncing uh, hippies and drug addicts and marijuana and, and this kind of thing. And, uh, and then we go to the climbing of the hill, uh, what some people said, oh, you got the burning bush in there symbolism of the burning bush because there had been a forest fire near that cross and we see Arinder walking and the bushes are all burned out. <laughs> I hadn't even noticed it when I shot it. So all this allegorical, metaphorical stuff, you know, kind of was there. And I just didn't realize it, but as I was editing and working on it, it began to get more and more evident. But I never, I never said, now we are about to see this, we're about to see that. Because I thought, well, making documentaries where you tell people voice of God, what this means and what that means, versus a documentary that really just documents people's thoughts and behavior. I'm going to go for the latter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go for an expressionistic thing where each individual shown is expressing themselves without me telling them what to do or say. And that became the final form. When most people think of Hollywood, they think show business. But as you said, you start the film with uh, politics. And it covers so much ground and so many different lives and, and cultures. Uh, how did you find these individual people to do your uh, portraits of them? Well, basically, it was a question of putting out the word in what you might call the Hollywood underground, although it was certainly out on the street, it wasn't hidden. And I said, I am going to make a documentary about 
the whole Hollywood concept, the world of Hollywood. Mondo, Hollywood. Mondo means world. Mm -hmm. Now, Mondo Kani was the first uh, movie that used the title Mondo. Mm -hmm. Mondo Kani in Italian mean, do, means dog's world. Okay? About vicious people cutting off the heads of animals and mm -hmm. this stuff, Mondo Kani. Although the, the song More was a great musical hit. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to do the Hollywood world, the world of what people think when they think Hollywood, superlatives. I'm here. I can realize my true self in Hollywood. I came to Hollywood to be a star. So this is the Hollywood world, the world of the imagination of people living in the Hollywood area. And that's, and that's what it turned out to be. The song even mentioned Hollywood, the streets are paved with gold. And all of these different people living very different lives were all searching that goal, but it was all different. It, it all meant something different to them. Hollywood, exciting and bold. Hollywood, you never grow old. Hollywood, the streets are paved with gold. Mm -hmm. That's the opening refrain. And this is what many people think. Of. This is what I thought of Hollywood as a child before I ever came to Los Angeles. Living in Philadelphia, this was it. The city of dreams, the city of fabulous heroes, heroines, beauty, everything. Well, as you show, there's far more than show business in politics. You've got uh, the anti-war peace activists, you've got acid-eating hippies, you have African-Americans, you have white middle-class surfers, you have wannabe actors, you have Academy Award-winning actors, you have a maladjusted millionaire, health food freaks, narcissists. You've got a little bit... I haven't seen that many fruits and nuts since the last time I was at Trader Joe's. <laughs> well, first of all, those are your words, not mine, okay? I never say maladjusted or fruits or nuts. I let everyone speak for themselves, okay? That's true. The film is very non-judgmental. There, there, there's no, the only judgment involved is, does it work and does it say something? Or in the viewer's head. Yeah, uh, yet people have been extremely judgmental. Uh, I wouldn't even look at this. Some, one one uh, would-be critic calls it a crapumentary. It's not <laughs> true at all. Another clever person says, why? Those aren't, that's not what they had to say. Those voices were looped in afterwards. Of course, the person using the terminology doesn't understand motion picture terminology. A loop is an endless thing that goes a loop around and around, like loop in traffic noise in the background, or loop in the sound of an airplane, you know, mm -hmm. something like this. Everything was narrated by the individuals after we had filmed them, after they had seen themselves on the screen as to what their thoughts were about themselves. There was no editing of what they had to say about themselves. There was no judgment. The millionaire, Louis Beach Marvin III, who is now deceased, uh, you call him maladjusted? Maladjusted to what? <laughs> Compared to what? Yeah. I mean, his, his dream, well, he had the money, vast amounts of money. I don't know how much, but a lot of money. He bought a mountaintop in Malibu, lived there, ran around with his monkeys and animals, uh, doing whatever pleased him. Now, I didn't see that as maladjusted or well-adjusted. I, 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 I think it was the hot coals on the crotch that got me. <laughs> well, they, were, they weren't directly on his crotch. They were in a container that was insulated, okay? He was trying to make a point about that you ha everybody has to be a, a sacrifice, a Christ, you know? Otherwise, you end it. Humanity is destroying itself. He's very, very humanistic in his, in his beliefs and expressed them. Did I think that was right or wrong? No, I thought that was him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, I would welcome someone doing a critical analysis of the film, going character by character, and relating that individual and their point of view to life in the United States at the time. Because the time, 1965, 66, 67, was a very particular time. Yes, it was summer of love and all that. Summer of love, Vietnam War, mm -hmm. still the Cold War, still the threat of nuclear annihilation. What is your name? Truth. What is your name? You, these are men who stand for death. I say it's treason. We'd be shot. He'd be shot on the spot. Hey, hey.